let's develop a wilderness venture a bit more. This is part two of a video, part two of two of a micro series on developing a wilderness adventure. I did the first one in the summer and I haven't really had the time to get back to it since. Uh, I've also done a dungeon adventure kind of development sample uh, of a couple of hours worth total over two videos. So what I did in the first video was I picked one of my settings that I wanted to develop some stuff for and talked a bit about what wilderness adventures are and I'll recap a tiny bit of that and I drew a map, a node map for a wilderness adventure in this case rather than, uh, so where you go along lines to other places in the wilderness rather than say hexes or whatever else and then we just sketched the adventure itself. Now what I'm using these terms to mean in terms of wilderness and dungeon and city is the other kind of adventure I would identify is the wilderness adventure is um, defined by extension in space and by exploration procedures and search procedures being at that kind of scale um, and calculated in those ways. The dungeon adventure is small scale with t in terms of space, it's intensive in space and there is a uh, an emphasis on detailed exploration of specific squares on the map if you like um, and using your concealed door skills or whatever else and that can happen anywhere but particularly the idea that you have the adventure clock and you're rolling for wandering monsters every 10 minutes or something uh, your light and your food are calculated on that basis so light becomes a more precious resource than food uh, because you're only going to eat once per adventure day pretty much or whatever how you're calculating it whereas the wilderness adventure is the other way around because you have to spend lots of time doing stuff your food and your ability to get to kind of safe longer term healing um, is very important uh, whereas in the dungeon adventure you just leave the dungeon and go back to the town to heal if you need natural healing and so there's a different rhythm to each which is determined by the geography so i'll just click this is the deep farms this is part of my grottos of the fallen fayarchy setting and the deep farms were this was a kind of this was an aquatic elf and high elf kind of coastal empire and the deep farms were where they made a lot got a lot of their food and where they had their bio labs uh, in their heyday and that's all fallen now and now there are still some of their servants or ex-servants there there's locatha um, and there uh, is some broken down technology and there is their fallen genetics labs and their Sahurgan raiders uh, with a kind of coral reef. This is, um, I know that's a set of sea mounts actually there. I think there's a reef there. But yeah, there's a set of sea mounts there as well. And you can see this is a point or node crawl. It's really a point crawl. Uh, I'm not assuming this is flux space. These are the points on the map you can get to. And you can see there's different connections to each uh, generally based on distance it's kind of an implicit thing based on distance and accessibility there's not particularly difficult seas some places are a lot easier to access the magical reef some places are harder or you have to go through several different locations to get there the genetics lab and you can see you've got these are the entrances from a kind of wider map which i, I sketched out at the time too and then this is how i write my adventure keys generally is two column and here I use, this is not, not really a piece of advice, just a uh, explanation. I use letters when I'm kind of listing locations. I use letters for either overland locations or if I'm writing a dungeon key for entrances and I use numbers in dungeons. So we came up with uh, 10 locations plus uh, a few bits of infrastructure at the top. Now, when I'm developing a wilderness adventure there, there's there are multiple things in a wilderness adventure in terms of the things that happen on the map and it's much more prone to hybridization than the dungeon adventure what i mean is the dungeon adventure mostly consists 99 percent of the time of a set of rooms or equivalents to rooms which you access you walk around you do stuff you explore uh, whereas the wilderness adventure and to a, a different in a different way the city adventure are hybrids in that they can often include other types of adventure or setting um, and I'll, I'll get to what I mean by that in a second uh, so you both you both have wilderness nodes or points or hexes where there is just essentially let's call them vignettes there is a one scene 
It's almost like a dungeon room, but it's a glade in a forest, or it's a very, very simple uh, building or something like that. You know, it's it's a, a, a hut, you know, a farmhouse with some bandits hiding in it, and it's got three rooms. It's not a dungeon adventure, it's just a tactical map, if you like, you want to put it that way. It then might have a 20-room dungeon or a 40-room dungeon. Um, it might have, and this is thing which isn't really a settlement, uh, sorry, an adventure per se, but is an adventure hub. It will, may have settlements in it. And when you're writing the overall wilderness adventure, you need to be able to put in those different kinds of things and determine where they are. And they each uh, imply different design parameters. And some good examples of what I mean by this hybridization is Slumbering Ursine Dunes by Chris Kutelik which is a point crawl like the one we're doing with vignettes at each scene and a couple of dungeons and a small settlement. Or again, uh, and the, the difference between this and just a place where there is a wilderness is say in T1 Village of Homlet or what T1 to War, Temple of Elemental Evil, there are villages described, there are dungeons described and there's not really anything else described. Uh, the same in a way even with B2 Keep on the Borderlands, there is a um, a, a hub, very well described. There is a dungeon, very well described. There are technically three other wilderness locations described, but the general kind of expectation of what you do there is just DM works out what Gary has provided is really a dungeon and a, uh, a, a settlement. The wilderness adventure creates the mesh and web that connects everything. So here we have an obvious settlement in location A, Locatha Village, Locatha being fishmen uh, who are not evil deep ones but just kind of friendly fish dudes and they're skeptical of outsiders, they are farmers and traders and I say rumour tra table if accepted, what I mean by that is if people get access to the village as friends they will be able to access rumours there, it, typically via a pub or the pub equivalent. Now I'm not going to write anything on the Locatha Village there because that's going to take a lot more detail, that's going to zoom in this is the overview of a wilderness area, and that's the zoom into something which will itself have many nodes. On the other hand, this beleaguered farm, the small Locatha settlement, needs help open to Alliance. That's not a settlement. It is a settlement in terms of there are people settled there, but it is not mechanically a settlement because it is not an adventure hub uh, with traders and, and rumour tables and things like that. It's a vignette, essentially. Again, uh, in terms of dungeons, let's say a really obvious dungeon is the Enlightening Labs. That's going to be a, a couple of levels. Uh, so you're probably talking about something which may end up being a 40 or 50 room dungeon. If not bigger, technically it could be. And that's something which, again, I'm when I'm writing just the wilderness key, I don't need to deal, detail that. Now, practically, if I was expecting to run this, you know, this weekend... For, for players, I would want to get a key for that as well, but that with the different parameters of a dungeon design involved. Uh, there are no cities here or indeed anywhere in the um, in this setting, so I don't need to worry about that kind of broader uh, hybrid of the city adventure. I'd say similarly, I've obviously marked the abandoned farm as a dungeon, inverted commas, and I think that's because it's not mostly internal areas. The enlightening labs are internal areas uh, with you know some levels with Sahugian camping out there and some and then sci-fi fantasy madness uh, dungeon underneath. This one I think is going to be smaller, but I haven't called it a mini dungeon. I have implied that you're going to have several areas close to each other, not miles away from each other, but you know f hundreds of feet away from each other, perhaps at most. Perhaps like uh, that that midway point, UK five. Uh, is it UK5? Beyond the Crystal Cave, which I have, UK1 I think it is, Beyond the Crystal Cave, which I reviewed elsewhere on the channel. So the idea with this is that uh, it's a dungeon but without walls. It's a dungeon where the barriers are different and the access points are different. Um, it's a, in that sense, it's a kind of a blend of genre. Then the rest of this stuff, that is, oh uh, yeah, the ruined Fayark Villa, also a dungeon. Uh, that's going to be a large overground, underwater in fact, location uh, with lots of treasure. It's going to have sub-levels and things like that. So that's three things plus the Le Village, four things, four out of ten, which aren't wilderness vignettes. So what, uh, and that's actually a fairly high concentration. You may well normally have 
one or two of those in a wilderness crawl of of 10 locations uh, but that's fine by me here um, what then is left to do well there is a there are two mini dungeons which is a vignette kind of thing there's a deep farm subway hub and there's a ruined lighthouse there's a small settlement needing help open to alliance uh, and then there is sargasso polluted reef and steaming gazers uh, so those you can see there are uh, two mini dungeons, one micro settlement, i.e. a friendly vignette, rather than an antagonistic vignette, and there are three hazard-like vignette areas. There's also a weather table and an encounter table. Uh, the encounter table is each point travelled. You roll a. It's going to. Uh, I think it's going to be one in six. So if you roll a one on a one d six, one of these encounters happened. Here I have got six entries. I could probably add some more. These ones, ones are like uh, Lakatha and Sahuagin are the sentients nearby. Dolphins are a sentient, in fact, but they're kind of a nice, potentially nice one. Giant lampreys, classic bad. Were shark and minions, and whirlpool. Um, we should probably add in sharks, just sharks. The Sahuagin may also have sharks, um, and that is let's. Possibly we actually want a 1D10 because there's a lot of points and people are going to be going back and forth probably. So we want, let's say, 10 so there's enough variety that you don't get too many repetitions. Hmm. See, there's some things like uh, aquatic dinosaurs which are quite fun, but I don't think quite fit this. Uh, slightly fairy inflected aqua this is the aquatic side of a of a coastal adventure location this is really the deepest underwater of, of re really of the uh, 10 grottos it's the one only one in the deep sea anyway it's also accessible from the start if players can get a boat at first or second level they can come here and maybe die but they can come here so dolphin lakatha uh, and see here this is a very obvious thing, but you know, when you're making an encounter table, whether it's going to be generic so that it can be easily reused, or if it's going to be heavily specific and flavorful, you need to know what those entries are doing on the list. Uh, because an encounter table is not simply, this sounds terrible, doesn't it? It's not simply a, a list of good ideas, and maybe it is, maybe you disagree with me, but I think an encounter table is one of the various mechanics you use to both challenge players and impart flavor remember not all uh, encounters are going to be bad but there needs to be a balance based on the area a kind of almost pseudo naturalistic balance that helps the players um yeah measure risk and understand the area and which provides them challenge based on the kind of geography they're in which gives them the, t the natural timers required to tell them when they need to get somewhere safe uh, that's one of the well, at least those are some of the things that encounter tables do. So the the encounter table is um, somewhat abstract in that it's not just the statistical chance of meeting someone, but also it can be used and, and probably should be used in many cases, particularly here in the wilderness, I think is the point, to represent natural events. So we've got a whirlpool, we've got a weather change. Let's also have reef. So there's a reef hazard. This is a smaller one than the polluted reef below, uh, but you can always have a hunting uh, opportunity as well. You could go and hunt some valuable fish or something. So, you know, risk reward. Hard to sell by if you're using second edition, you'd be using your non-weapon proficiencies to do so. Uh, but yeah, you can go and get something out of it. You've got some monsters, you've got Sahuagin, sharks, giant lampreys, and a were shark and his minions. So a kind of a micro faction who just wander around on the random encounter table causing trouble. Uh, but they, they uh, and, and perhaps what I, if I were properly writing it up, I might say they do have a layer um, out in the deeper ocean, uh, which, you know, you could go and chase them down in if you wanted, you know, that sort of thing. And then you've got a few natural things, reef hazard, weather change, whirlpool. Now, we we'll probably we want one more. Let's put in... I don't know if I'd keep that one necessarily, but I think it's a useful start. Tuna. So you've got, and 
well, I don't know. That's one of those things I need to check the ecology. I'm, I think it's actually too warm implicitly where I've put it here uh, for tuna to be there. But then maybe tuna are, are tolerant of warmer waters. We'll put it in inverted commas. There's going to be a hunting opportunity. Basically, there's a risk with a hunting opportunity and there is just a hunting opportunity. And this is good because people can make money out of it. I mean, maybe, I, in fact, that it's that there, there's an argument you put a whale for hunting opportunity rather than tuna. And there, there's something where, you know, whales were an incredibly valuable economic feature of lots of countries. They still are to, uh, whale hunting is to a lesser degree now, uh, and we've somewhat turned against it. Uh, but the idea that your players might be able to make money out of that, well, in the end, and take the risks to get the money uh, that they produce out of that, is something which, you know, given you're saying you can go around butchering villages if you want, dear players, a bit of a whale hunting is probably a reasonable thing for them to consider as a risk reward. On the other hand, there will be downsides to it. You know, you can have intelligent whales, you can have killer whales who go and hunt down whale hunters. You can, uh, that's something I could add to that to spice that up. The weather table is the other bit of infrastructure uh, to do. And this is, you could use something like Wilderness Survival Guide. Um, some people actually quite like things like the weather tables out of, I think it's weather tables out of that. Uh, you could use just about anything. It, I sometimes use other tables. Sometimes I kind of make it up. D20, if it's, I think, in the top quarter, it's raining sort of thing. Dolmenwood, I think the Dolmenwood campaign book, which is currently being backed by Patreon, has, I think, a weather table. But here, C is important to know what weather there is, but if nothing else, because of sales. Um, so because you don't actually want to simulate weather systems that are realistic, because basically the risk, the cost benefit is so poor, just roll 1d10 each day. Most of us have no idea why weather works like it does, uh, unless specifically we're dealing with hurricanes that we know develop off the coast in particular circumstances so beyond that roll 1d10 each day is probably fine um so one to three clear uh, light wind four to five clear strong winds clear uh, doesn't necessarily mean sunny of course six uh, rain light wind seven um in fact, let's make that six to seven. Let's make that eight to nine. Rain, strong wind, and ten. Uh, in fact, no, we need, you know what we actually do need? It's going to be two, three to four, five. Clear, no wind. That's bad. Uh, rain, light wind, rain, strong wind, ten. Rain, storm wind. So you've got a one in ten chance. I mean, that might be a bit harsh. Maybe actually make it 1d12 because... Uh, you don't want it to be too painful. So yeah, you've got a 1 in 12 chance each day of one or other of the adverse events, really adverse events. I think there's stuff where, again, if you're using non-weapon proficiencies for se seamanship, then or you're using ship rules from e.g. of ships in the sea, then you're going to worry about that. If you're using um, some of the naval combat rules from even from first edition DMG, you're going to be using, um, you're going to want some of the background weather. And you could make that much more detailed for our purposes now, that's enough. And I, I'd feel happy to run that and I'd feel I can translate that into other rules. So now we've got a very basic encounter table, a very basic weather table, and we've identified four areas which require breakout sessions to develop three of them using dungeons one using a settlement and in fact i will use this settlement when i make a settlement building video we'll use this lakatha village but we do have one two three four five six yep uh, locations and these are as i say these are the vignette ones these are ones where they're it's sort of a couple of rooms at most at least in terms of what the players deal with and in that case, you just want to write a paragraph or two each, don't you? You don't want to end up writing um, two columns on each of these vignettes unless there's something incredibly interesting there. But yeah, so let's let's just have a go at some of these. Smaller Catholic settlement needs help open to alliance. 
Uh, so let's just get check this on the map. Beleaguered Farm. Uh, it is between a ruined lighthouse, which I think is where we said those Sahuagin are, and the genetic labs where there's more Sahuagin. Um, and further out to see this ruined submarine villa is implicitly further over here, I think. Uh, so that's why the points run like that, the, uh, the point lines. So in that case, they, and that they are to the north of steaming gazers and the sea mounts. And so they're not in a particularly good position, you know, since the Sahuagin have moved in from the deep ocean on their raids and have sent a garrison in, um, they are kind of screwed. So what can what, what they want is fewer Sahuagin. They want this cleared out. Uh, there needs to be some incentive for the players. So the basic hook is Lakatha need lighthouse cleared out. Um, because then if you think about the way the map works, they can then travel around via the Giza area to the skeptical Lakatha village. Uh, what do they have? And this is the thing, I think the idea that they actually have something really good, partly because nasty players, evil players, will say, okay, we'll just rob them. Uh, but it is then a, a strong incentive for good players, inverted commas, yeah, by, the, I, by, by that I mean good characters to help. Um, and so uh, I guess we'll, that we'll, yeah, we'll send um, a warrior to be a scout. Uh, well, well, we'll send a, um, a second level. Hmm. Yeah, I think some someone leveled, like they've got a level dude who will go with them. So a second uh, level fighter um, to guide them, to guide party if helped. And we'll give a magic item. Because they're, they're, they have, uh, well, they, they the Lakatha, I've got different currency systems in this setting. The Lakatha use carry shells, so they'll give um, XX carry shells. I'll check the conversion rate for, you know, basically something like uh, 300 GP. That's not very much. I would count that, by the way, as treasure gained. Uh, I would tend to be happy to count that as treasure gained in a dungeon. Um, I know that's a bit of a house rule because it's not actually been extracted, but... It's something where that's useful for at places where there's no clear dungeon. So, for instance, in um, T1, my campaign in, in T1 to 4, looking for a saboteur on the work crews of the castle in Homlet, um, I used Burns' financial reward as a... Because the players were taking risks, Burns' financial reward was gold as XP. Uh, they didn't have to take it from anywhere. It was the equivalent of them finding something and taking it because he gave it to them in response to the risks they took in that place. Um, and that's the same. We, If you're just doing rules as written, I think that is actually what you'd do for in-dungeon rewards because it'd be treasure removed from a dungeon if someone gave you it in return for something. But yeah, so they're going to give them 300 GP. I think that's something like 30 uh, carry shells or whatever it is that the Catholic Lakatha use. It's not carry shells, that's what the local humans use. I need to check that anyway. Uh, but yeah, we'll give that and a um, they don't need they don't need potions of swimming or anything. Uh, but they might have something left over from the genetics lab, mightn't they? Um, and a uh, a gill uh, a dermagill. So something vaguely scientific fun, uh, sounding which is maybe a, uh, like a one one use um, ring of swimming. Mm, potion of water breathing, allowing speech. So you can you give it to a spellcaster. It's like airy water, for, which allows verbal component spells. Um, now, the remaining information I think we need on that one is probably just there are 10 Lakatha. Uh, one F two, two F zero, or three F zero probably. Um, others non-combatant. Um, I guess the elderly there might be able to lift a spear, uh, but yeah. So they live in um, a hardened metal bunker 
it's way past their technology now, uh, which they can't maintain. Um, they live, they're living hiding. This is how they survived the Sahugan raids. They farm, uh, I think for them, let's make them kelp farmers. So they're, they're then farming kelp. They're having to go out after the Sahugan attack, then they go out and farm, but then they have to run in. Um, and uh, they uh, don't have you know, strong resources to do so. But yep, so that's that location. You go there, they are actually open to talking, whereas the other Lakatha are a bit suspicious. Um, perhaps that's one way you become friends with the other Lakatha villagers. You can earn their trust by helping their friends. The outlying farm. Um, and it gives you an introduction into... At this setting if you come from this direction then you can do that so steaming gazes is a hazard I this is something where typically I guess I might actually do some research and look at how other adventures do this but I think realistically um, either it's going to be an NWP check or a uh, percentile check for either NWP check to avoid or a percentage check for incidents um, and an incident would be I guess uh, damage to ship and splash damage uh, 1d10 save versus breath halves for those on deck uh, or in water uh, you could make it a lot worse in water and certainly that's that's not unlike a first or second edition module particularly you know the the better end of that uh, but yeah that one's a simple one in terms of that doesn't need to be something where players are constantly getting hurt by it you want it to be a hazard but one because it's on the wilderness map it needs to be something that doesn't screw the players every time uh, remember a hazard that is particularly an avoidable hazard in the dungeon is something where you can pull the stops out on how unpleasant it is uh, but here with the exact way that I've set up the map and of course it may well be the map can be improved but here you're expecting people to come either from location not here or location over over here and then um, that by the way the red is a subway line which is to be fair that's tracking back to the I think to the aquatic no not to the is it to the aquatic elves or to the tritons um, the one of the other civilized areas uh, but yeah, it's, I think, to the, mm, I think to the Aquatic Elves. Uh, but yeah, so you've got, uh, and the Aquatic Elves are isolationists, so they're not coming to help. So yeah, you, it gives you a way in um, here that you can go, if you, you come past the lighthouse, you possibly avoid it the first time. Uh, maybe uh, that's something we need to give some incentive, disincentive for just turning up there straight away. The steaming geezers are then an obstacle that way, or if you're coming from the Lakathas in the north, they're an obstacle that way. That is just occasionally annoying and saps uh, resources, and the, uh, and therefore that players will start to think about how to solve. And you let players solve it if they come up with something that deals with geezers in the in the sea. Great. Um, Beleaguered's uh, Lakatha farm there is then blocked by that or and that depending on the location you're coming from. Um, so that's two out of six Sargasso so we've got these two mini dungeons and we've got two more hazardy areas so the Sargasso this is going to be a random table kind of place um, it's slow to travel through so uh, double time I'd need to work out all the distances here but double time through uh, point um, roll for getting lost to uh, if lost double again so it's a mixture of social and combat encounters mini lo uh, locations so let's say ship with thirsty crew um, Lacodons, yeah, probably say that's seagulls. Uh, Lacodons in um, Seamount Caves. 
So you're like, man, there's somewhere we could stop in the Sargasso uh, because it looks interesting. And of course, you can put treasure in there and stuff. But there's there's ghouls in there who can swim around as well. And, uh, and that's something which I, as a DM reading this and as I'm publishing it, that's something I feel comfortable leaving less detailed. You just be like, there's Lacodons living in a couple of caves, or like partially sunken caves. Um, in one, there is a chest with this much gold. You know, you can make it very basic, can't you? And it's usable and it's a nice vignette. Three, um, let's say it's a uh, a man of war, a Portuguese, um, <laughs> there are no Portuguese here in, in this place. Portuguese man of war um, lurking, so combat encounter. Uh, lost Locatha, so that's another way in Lost Sahagin, probably, um, and maybe one more, so it's D6. Now this is tough that um, you might, you, I could quite reasonably make this like a D20 table, so that you, you're, each time through you roll one and then you roll another one if you get lost. So each time through this node uh, you might see a couple of these, uh, but um, for now I'll leave it at six, partly because practically in a session or two, that's three trips, and you always can just either create to make something no entry, or you can repeat it. The C mount can be repeated, or you can, if it's a one off and you want to make sure they encounter something, you like that's the way you like your tables. You just uh, go up to the next one up. So, six, we want one more here. Um, let's say, so we've got in terms of we've got Lacodons and C mount K's risk reward, ship with thirsty crew, mostly an opportunity. Because it's it's moored there. Portuguese man of war lurking, bad. Lost Lacatha, good. Lost Huygen, probably bad. So we want another maybe ambivalent one, and this could this feels like an event or weird thing. Uh, so hmm, let's come back to that. Let's come back to that while we think about it. Polluted reef, slight sailing hazard. ship takes damage that's an easy one magically polluted that's a thematic thing so description so if i write that up properly i'd say it looks like this these, these are some um dungeon dressing style features to describe weird monsters and events this again this is the thing both the reef and the sargasso are acting as um micro event nodes they're not dungeons they don't have maps they're not themselves wildernesses because you don't intentionally travel between things. Uh, they're both unmappables, kind of softly unmappable because of their, their nature. Mm. And I think uh, my sense is that this is something which then uh, becomes one of the... And you've got the reef... They're actually next to each other as well, which may be a mistake. Might be something where you actually want to end up swapping let's say, uh, the reef and the geezers. That would be not a bad swap, in fact. Uh, it doesn't matter now, but yeah, swapping the reef and the geezers would mean that you had the event, the micro-event hubs on different sides, and then you had this straight uh, obstacle between the Sargasso and the Genetic Labs. But anyway, Polluted reef, weird monster, giant clownfish. Yep, that's good. Giant clownfish trying to do something to you. Talking coral. Mm. Um. <laughs> Colour spray, J just spells casting at your ship out of the polluted coral. Uh, mutated Sahagin. Basically, there's just sharks everywhere. Mm -hmm. Triple shark. There's three sharks there, one thing. Uh, and another polluted reef kind of thing. Uh, what would what would you expect in a polluted uh, reef up? Oh, so talking coral, undead mobile coral. Like it's bleached and then it's detached. And the, and you're like, yeah, yeah, but surely the, the boat that the coral uh, hard coral is just the dead stuff. Yes, exactly. Undead mobile coral. Um, 
good nightmare fuel there. Lost, and now back to the Sargasso. What, if anything, um, maybe we'll just do something else as well whilst we're waiting on that. One more thing that gets stuck in Sargasso or you might have in a sort of slightly maze-like area. Uh, the Deep Farm Subway Hub, ruined but with salvageable tech, inhabited by a dangerous monster. Mini dungeon, it's underwater. Um, because to get, So you can sail over it, but it's because this is all clear, tropical seas, coral reefs and stuff. Not far off the coast, really. Um, you can see down and what would be... So we want to establish a few things here. Again, it needs to be vignette sized. It needs to be something that either people are rolling just a thing that happens, as in these cases, um, or it is a... Um, so it's something you just roll at the table, or it's a couple of details and lines about uh, what's there so that it's a usable mini location. Um, so sandwichable tech... Let's say, so it's going to have a broken train. It's going to have, or broken loco, I should say. Um, with, I think something from the heyday of the, let's get to say, it ha will have a Lakatha Fayarchy medallion. The medallions being kind of access tools um, and ID markers. Uh, in a bag secreted under a seat that carry seat um, resilient bag there we go um, and there's going to be I mean, there's, we're going to have the monster on the train, aren't we? Um, it's uh, going to be a ghost train. I don't actually want it to be a ghost train, but I think a ghost, um, a Russian ghost. Uh, so, oh, no, mm, a, uh, uh, yeah, a metal ghost. So some kind of like a ghost, almost the ghost of the machine, the ghost of the ruined technology. Uh, who, yeah, uh, is stalks this thing. Uh, in that case, uh, let, we want, let's have. We also want the um, ticket office with a working waterproof ticket machine. That's just to get, you know, uh, for sale or gimmick. It's treasure you're removing from a dungeon, so. One fun thing, I've made that incredibly lucrative. It is fun sometimes to put really expensive things in easy to find places. Um, in the same way that it's fun to very occasionally make hard to find locations not worth it very much. Don't do it too often, it's quite annoying. I, I, I do run into this in adventures which aren't against putting treasure out there but there's just rooms with like it's the classic you go through five rooms between them you get 17 copper whilst having to fight 15 monsters uh, you know that's bad design i think not because it has to be but because anyone who has come to that conclusion probably has not understood how to make those rooms interesting or things the players want to do uh, but in this case the idea that there's a tr there's a loco with a few things we should add one one or two more extra things uh, but with a uh, for sale or as a gimmick. And that's just really pricey. You don't need to risk yourself at all if you think about it, if you think about going in there um, under rubble. So put it, put it under the kind of broken down uh, metal and, and stonework or whatever. A broken train with Lakatha Fayaki and what else could be on? We probably, because this probably has been looted somewhat and eaten up, uh, but there probably are one or two useful things. Um, sealed um, magic fuel unit um, if opened 3 d12 explosion warning signs yeah that's got warning signs on it uh, that could also be I mean that could actually be warning signs um, 
and one more thing on there. Mm. Uh, let's say, uh, so this is kind of exalted style Magitek, I think is my idea for what the Feyarchy was and is no longer. Or at least that's some of what they do. Um, this, so who would be on this train when it was abandoned during the fall or, or when it broke down? Could be anyone really, couldn't it? Um, let's say an aquatic elf. Mm. Aquatic elf skeleton with uh, earrings embedded in to scars. They're kind of there, but then also hooked there behind into the jaw. Into jaw. So that's a way of, it, it's called magic item, difficult to retrieve and risks alienating the isolationists who might be able to help you. But that, that is, I mean that one might end up being like a, a half page. So that's a long room, but it's not more than a room. Something else that gets lost in Sargasso, a floating treasure chest with trapped lock. So it's stayed buoyant, but uh, there's a risk. So what we've done, we've done the deep farm subway hub, we've done the polluted reef, we've done the sargasse, uh, we've done the steaming geysers. So we've got this ruined lighthouse. Mm. Uh, the Sahuagin have a heat projector which they can use underwater but they haven't got this in their main garrison but they've uh, installed this at uh, the top by passing ships uh, bad to hit modifiers but dangerous so basically this is a way to warn off ships that unless players have worked out what to do they're likely to go elsewhere aren't they they're likely to run and gun and because uh, on the because on the node map here uh, you can see uh, though that is a, a line we don't just send in a straight line this all kind of represents all this ocean these are the options for kind of getting between places the sea mount is interrupting this hence why you don't go straight from the geezers to the farm uh, so you know it's encouraging players just to say do you want to go kind of westerly or northerly basically to get away from this those are the ways you can go that aren't going way out into the deep ocean or going into the sea mount. Uh, so here they've got a heat projector. Um, let's say there's eight Sihuagin, uh, one leader, two on patrol at any time, two on heat projector, which is going to leave three on guard. Um, now that's the thing, it, the fact that it's a lighthouse means that the two are going to have to be out um, in, out of the water, which they don't love. So the leader may not be there. Uh, but yeah, uh, they've got two on the heat projector and three on guard. Uh, that's the, the, so the lighthouse bit is smashed up. It's got a heat projector. Um, and then living quarters uh, which let's uh, who might have lived there i think probably a uh, locatha um, so in secret compartment locatha art worth 500 say uh, the locatha art is going to be what did Akatha like? I, and I might, I, I kind of need to check what I thought their currency was. Like pearls, that was it, they used pearls. Um, so, but that's not gonna be their art. Let's say uh, string of pearls. Uh, let's 
make it something like that. Uh, but a catharat, which could be uh, coral and shell and sparkling fish skin uh, sealed onto uh, baleen. So this kind of bit of whale baleen this big with kind of uh, patterns uh, in abstract patterns or whatever else on, um, that have been sealed onto the baleen. Uh, string of pearls. So there's some stuff there, but you've got to find it. Uh, living quarters are going to have, let's say, uh, one Sahuagin in. And then uh, entrance pier to Sahuagin. Or entrance, yeah. So basically there are, that, that means there's two at the top, one in the middle, two at the bottom. And then the leader is either in the water or... In living quarters so very small dungeon again you could do that in half a page with a very small map you don't even really need the map frankly for that so I, I think that is everything done there uh, at this point we're at f less than 500 words fewer than 500 words we've got a weather table and an encounter table we've got two more encounter tables here for two areas we have worked out in terms of the iteration that uh, it may be more fun to swing around uh, a couple of the hazards so that the randomly generated hazards are spread and the fixed hazard, the geezers, is in one place. Uh, and yeah, we have done, we've talked about a micro settlement, we've talked about a micro dungeon there, and we've done another micro dungeon here. Now, obviously, I haven't statted some of the stuff we've made up there, uh, I haven't statted the the kind of techno ghost. Um, I haven't stated, I need to check like what's a mutated Sahurgin when it's at home, undead mobile coral field, triple shark. You know, these are things that would need work. Um, that's something which of course, if this ends up being a product, that there'll be a monster com monstrous compendium that's gonna have, um, you know, uh, <laughs> ambulant undead coral and uh, the triple shark. So people will be able to go there and look at that. Uh, but no, I think that's something where Within a margin of error, I'd feel confident about running most of that um, now as a crawl. Now, if we got to one of these unwritten sections, I'd need to do something about it. Uh, and so the next stage for Grotto seven or Grotto 8 is going to be to uh, to expand those and write those up because they need more attention currently than fully writing the, the subway hub. The other thing this really needs is that the specialist monsters, the metal ghost, the triple shark, the under mobile coral, um, things like that. The Portuguese man of war, at least finding an equivalent for that. And I think all those actually are official ones. Uh, though the hunting opportunity, I'm going to have to have rules somewhere or point to them from somewhere to know how that works. Uh, the second level fighter I might want to stat because I've tended to do that across. Um, the the other settlements and mini areas that I've written um, because it's fun it gives character to the the characters that players meet but yeah there we are uh, what do you think uh, how do you I guess develop your wilderness adventures I'm going to leave this here for now but I will as I say I will develop a settlement based on the undevelopment settlement here that will be my next kind of how to do something or how I do anyway Till next time.